Okay, we talked a little bit about let's we'll just kind of go back a little bit um, to review this and then we'll finish that up and then we'll go into Jonathan Lear, the desire to understand. We talked about objective versus subjective. Now it's interesting because in ethics class today, we were doing the same thing. This happened to be, we're going over what's called meta-ethics. So meta-ethics is, this, what is the status of ethics? Is everything just, uh, well, that's just your opinion, man. Can somebody name that movie? The Lebowski, participation points are earned. For <laughs> I'll play, should I play it? All right, now I need to share screens so that Brooke can see. Otherwise, Brooke will be, have no idea what's going on. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Mm -hmm. One more yeah. time. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. What's the context before that? There's no other snack like a bag of What else can you allow your car's company to a crystal bowl and feed? Come on, add. I hate these things. No, yeah, I know. Used to remember the good old days. I forgot about that. 
any connection. Oh, you're ready to be fucked up. I see you roll your way in the tennis. Leo, 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 me, we're gonna fuck you up. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, her opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that's the context of. So, we were talking about subjectivism which is that's just your opinion is everything just opinion what you're saying no science is concerned with objective facts so it was interesting in this book it was mentioning look let's give i like how he puts it um you you don't have this book but i just kind of read out of this real quick There are, he says there's a million objective truths. How he was able to calculate that, I don't know. Here are three at random. The planet Jupiter has a greater mass than Mercury. That's sort of like my example of the sun so much, how many miles from the earth. John Milton wrote, Paradise Lost, Galileo is dead. It doesn't matter what you think about these claims. And it doesn't matter what I think about them. It doesn't matter whether I care about these claims. It doesn't matter whether believing them satisfies my desires, right? Objective facts don't care about that. Neither personal opinion nor conventional wisdom makes these claims true. They are true and would remain true even if no one believed them. So that's a pretty good kind of summary of what somebody would think objective facts are. What would be another objective fact? Now notice it doesn't say things that people can't disagree with. And what did we go over? We went over the psychology. Why is it that people tend to say science is objective and philosophy is subjective? will have something to do with kind of the psychology of agreement, right? Agreement is a powerful drug that can influence the way that you think. Objective facts, would you say this is an objective fact? Milton again wrote Paradise Lost. If something's can that change? Am I going to wake up tomorrow and it's like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you it's not four. Now, there's nothing about the status of this that overrides your free will and such that you have to agree. You could always be the naysayer in the back of the class, like, nah, I don't believe it. Now, usually there's, other than just being a jerk, there's no reason why you would want to say that. But somebody doesn't have to agree that Milton wrote Paradise Lost or Galileo's Dead. What makes it true? Agreement? No, notice what... Uh, your old buddy, uh, Russ Schaefer Landon has to say about, doesn't matter, it's not dependent, it's independent of your desires, your beliefs. That's the very notion of what objective is, and it doesn't change. Now, usually, and here, I'm gonna give you a counter example. Again, psychologically, people would think, well, something subjective, if people have different beliefs on it. So if I asked you, we'll take an easy example of something that we would all say is subjective, the taste of something. And everybody has a different belief. Well, there's nothing objective about. It's not like one of you are wrong. And I like how he puts this because you're not describing 
the truth of a state of affairs, you're describing, you're giving a description of your psychology or experience. So if you said, uh, one of my students last class says, I don't like the taste of tapioca. What am I gonna say? No, you're wrong, you do, you just don't. <laughs> She's reporting back to me like I don't like the taste of tapioca. Where it would be different if she said tapioca doesn't exist. Then I could say, oh, you're wrong about that. But I can't say, so the former, i.e., I don't like the taste of tapioca. I actually personally do, but obviously my student doesn't, is subjective. dependent upon her. So if it was something like that, if everybody gave a different answer or belief about something, we might think it's like the tapioca. It's obviously not an objective thing. And guess what? Taste can change too. Has, has anybody ever had something that they liked or disliked and then it changes? What? Uh, uh, Potatoes. Interesting. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. You know what's funny? So my dad like hates uh, sweet potatoes and yams. And actually, here's an example where it might be a, a refutation that um, you actually do like them. You know how I proved that? I made a Moroccan casserole and put yams in there, and I didn't tell him. I, said, this is delicious. And I just looked. My, my mom and I were the only went on on of the little stunt I pulled and I was like, geez, it's bad. That's three strikes. <laughs> oh. um, who else had a, and I need to give, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I've heard in COVID. Oh, so I, yeah, I ran into, I like to get uh, the wine at the Island Liquor there really. And she was telling me, I can't stand red wine. I can't taste red wine after COVID. Like permanently altered her. Um, last names we had. And who else? Okay, so let's go back. Well, everybody in philosophy disagrees about stuff, right? What did we give some examples of philosophical questions? Like some big ones? Does God exist? What is God? Who is God? Um, what is the universe finally made of? Is everything just physical? Um, are there immaterial entities, properties? Um, is there a soul? Is the soul immaterial? Um, are mind and brain distinct? I'm trying to think of what's the correct political regime. Go ask why, and you're going to get universal disagreement. Whereas in member science, you ask some of those fundamental questions how many elements there are, 114 in the periodic chart. You get universal. Are there electrons? Yes. Inverse. Square law, scribes, gravity. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? Forty-two. I did a Jordan Peterson impersonation last class. Should I do it again? Yeah. 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 Oh well, it depends what you mean by the meaning of life. Depends on what you mean by meaning. You know, there's ten rules that we got for the class. Who doesn't know Jordan Peterson? So we're going to have to, I'm just going to keep queuing up. Let's see if I got him down. Good. We'll, we'll judge it based on. Um, in America? Ah, why can't I? There are some that don't have ads. Like it, like, just like, like when, I don't have when there's an ad. Yeah. Was 
Because I don't want to listen to that dude talk. Oh, it's capable. But this light. This light. Okay, I bought it. Um, uh, it's just this whole guy talking? All right, I'm. Okay, what do I. How about this one? Yes. No. You gotta obviously whoever you're in person you gotta exaggerate a little bit right but he always kind of sounds like kermit the frog to me you know can fools for picking up their room first to start with rule number one like wow it's so deep start with rule number one okay now let's go and think about this. No, because what philosophy is going to do, we don't want to just have true beliefs. We want to have good reasons for them. And that requires arguments. We brought up last class, we all might agree to wash your hands and washing your hands after you go to the toilet is is good. We all, I hope we all believe that. And then remember, you asked me, well, why do you think that that's a good thing? And I told you because there's invisible aliens all over your hand. If you don't wash those off, um, the stock market will crash, or like the population of cattle in Montana will decrease. Like, where it's like, well, <laughs> you got to a true belief for all the wrong reasons. So we're going to, obviously you don't want to believe something false, but the things that you believe are true, you want to believe for the correct reasons. Therefore, if going back to, does it follow? Is it, good, is it a good reasoning to say, simply because everybody's giving an answer, does that mean there is no objective answer? It wouldn't. So if we took something that's objective, you all said that this was objective, and everybody I asked gave me in this classroom a different number. That wouldn't follow that there's no objective answer. What would follow is not everybody's correct. Maybe everybody's wrong. Maybe one person is correct. So think about that. It might be the case that if everybody's giving different answers about something, for example, we gave the issue of like food and taste, that's because it's subjective, but it doesn't necessarily follow. Why? Because I thought, and this is what we call in philosophy, a counterexample. Well, I think a lot of things that people could disagree about, that doesn't mean there's no uh, right answer. Now, people typically say like, well, who's to judge? Well, I find it funny that it's in a personal pronoun, like who? Like what? Re reality. <laughs> Isn't that the kind of definition of object? Reality independent of you. Like, like that's the standard rule of the judge, right? It's not a who, it's a what. Uh, somebody have a question? No. Um, but let's think about this. What if I gave you a calculus problem? Compute the limit of some function. 
and I pass it around, am I going to get in this classroom? I'm using calculus because this is in a calculus class. So do you think I get the same answer? Is that because there's nothing objectively true about, about that? Well, it might be the difficulty level. So think about that with philosophy. You might be getting different answers because there's different things involved. It might be more difficult. Mathematics is pretty straightforward. Why? Because you don't have to consider your political allegiance, your religion, your various experiences, and other things to get that. But what happens when you start getting in the fields that involve what's called values? Things get more complicated, right? You have to think through a lot more issues. There could be a lot. I mean, there's very few things that influence me other than just learning the mathematics to give the mathematics answer as a correct answer. That's why we philosophers like to use mathematics as examples, because it just kind of cuts away. It makes things really clear. Perhaps people give different philosophical answers because there's things that influence them too, good or bad. You're now having to consider a whole host of other belief systems, religion, experiences that might make it a lot more difficult. So that's something to think about. So we've come to the conclusion that no, just because people are disagreeing doesn't mean that it's subjective. It could be difficult. There could be various reasons and motivations for saying. Furthermore, it's interesting if you look at the history of science. Now we get to get into some of the philosophy of science. Let's say, I was gonna to try to find a timeline, but let's do 500 BC because that's really when philosophy and science begin. Um, 250. I may have the exact date. So if you ask a science question, I think we brought this up a little bit last class. Is the earth the center? or the sun is it geocentric or heliocentric. So this is my timeline of science. Am I going to get the same answer? Let me make sure I get the year correct. No, actually. From this entire period, it's geocentric. It would actually be further because I think that's just when he was born, 1466. And then what's funny is when he proposes that, it's not even accepted. It's not accepted until basically Galileo Galilei. Um, so this whole time period. Um, how many elements are there? Same answer? No. Throughout this, it probably about four. It's not until
do you actually even get the periodic chart? Before then, you would have, hold on a second. I remember my Dalton. Dalton's atomic theory, 1803. So basically, this whole time period all agrees, this disagrees. I'm trying to think of different scientific uh, theories. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that was ever a scientific theory, actually. I don't know exactly who. That could have been just kind of like common folk or something like that. But it's for like I've studied the history, so I don't remember anybody ever kind of thinking that. Uh, but what I was going to say is Newton. Newton versus Einstein. Um, Newtonian kind of mechanics versus Copenhagen School of quantum mechanics, stuff like that. There's no, or the history of the science, there's hardly any agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, because the way science works, focus in, zoom in on anyone. period of time and you're going to have agreement why because we talked about science is concerned with making doing applying right not simply just describing so in order to have kind of a practical knowledge like that you've got to get people on board you can't be arguing about how many elements there are what theory you're going to accept now, interesting enough, yes, if you zoom in on any one of these and from a philosophical standpoint and look at what philosophers, we're all arguing with each other, nobody agrees. However, guess what? Over it's a matter of perspective, over the large period of the history of philosophy, those big questions I just mentioned, is there a God? Um, are there immaterial properties or entities? Is there a soul? Um, almost universal agreement. Isn't that interesting? Now, somebody could obviously say, well, the science is just getting better. We're just learning more. And that's my question to you. What theory is actually correct, the geocentric or heliocentric? Helio. You say helio. Anybody else want to take another one? Uh, okay, so we all believe the helio, but why? You'd given a reason because technology has advanced. Here is the Ptolemaic system, the geocentric. I've read all of it, and it's all mathematics, and all the mathematics checks out. Yeah, but he didn't have an instrument to measure distance of the celestial body. Neither did uh, Kepler. Yeah, but we do now. Um, and you could just adjust the, the distance of celestial bodies and still keep it geocentric. So his system isn't based on the distances of celestial bodies. It's based on, is it the Earth the center with the planets moving around or is it the sun the center? So you could adjust within your theory. Okay, now I have instruments to measure different stuff. It wouldn't overthrow the theory. So why did we change? Oh, 
all that could be accommodated in and you don't get the theory of Newton's theory of gravity until much later. That might actually be a reason. So typically we like to think that we just collect more evidence and we realize certain things were false. Uh, now I call it the, well, we now know fallacy. You've heard me say, we all know this in debates, people, atheists typically do this. We now know the Bible is a dusty fairy book. I'm like, what happened? We now know fallacy, right? That's not an argument. That's just a, an assertion. You can't say, just say something like that. Um, and again, consensus doesn't make something right. The totalitarian regimes of history had a consensus. Certain societies in which you find practices abominable have consensus. It doesn't make it right. Okay, so what you find out is if you, and this is a good, I recommend reading Kuhn's Structures of Scientific Revolutions here. of scientific revolution. And look what he talks about, an analysis of the Copernican revolution. Emphasize that in the beginning, it did not offer more accurate predictions of celestial events such as blah, blah, blah. So he's comparing it to the Ptolemaic system. Now, somebody had actually said, oh, because we can do more things. Well, so this is this, well, one works and one doesn't. But guess what? Both systems work. In fact, all the data in the Ptolemaic of the where the recordings of the celestial bodies are still used in our system today. We actually, they're accurate. The mathematics is good. I'm telling you the only difference is switching the position of if I were at the sun with things, if from, because we're on the earth, right? And it looks like what? Does it does it look or feel like you're flying around the sun? No, because it's your perspective. But what if you put your perspective on the sun? Would things look different? Yeah, they would. How would you describe that? That's really the, the difference between the two paradigms. And then you work out. One of them, the Copernican was supposed to eliminate, there's something called epicycles here. So notice there's something called retrograde motion. When you start to plot out, the planets, you'll see them do this, like that. Some will go like this. Like, for example, um, let's say um, east to west, you see the sun do like that. But sometimes some planets will do this. They'll start to go from east to west, back to east. That's called retrograde motion. And the way that Ptolemy explained that is, so the sun is not on an epicycle. So the sun goes around like that. So you should from here see what? East to west, right? East to west. Now imagine, let's take Mars, for example. So imagine an invisible point going around, like the sun. Then around that point, in Mars. See what I'm doing there? So you have one circle doing this. You have two motions. So what are you going to see? Mathematics, it works out. The thing is that Copernicus and Kepler were like, yeah, but you got to call the two mathematical causes to explain that. If I flip it, for the sun, I can actually describe that using only one mathematical, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It just means maybe in science you would prefer something like that. Okay, furthermore, oh, there it goes. There's the retrograde that you can see called the epicycle. 
it wasn't based on evidence. And what Thomas Kuhn shows is that every paradigm shift, it's not like you gather more and more evidence. He says it's sort of like a revolution. At some point in the society, the community, they get tired of the old regime for whatever reasons, and they throw it out. But both systems work. In fact, sailors will still use a tall mix that you can predict exactly where the plants are going to be. You can actually navigate. Yeah. So Solomon, if the system works for the location of the planet, but like it doesn't work like with Venus, a Venus is full when it's across the sun from us, but then it will get less and less full as it gets closer to us. And the tall mix doesn't point that at all. Um, yeah, they're called anomalies, but what I'm thinking, if I remember, you can adjust that. Like, you would just come up with another, you'd have to have some type of account for, but that's, I don't think it's necessarily particularly devastating for the system. Yeah, I mean, all the numbers still work. So. Um, in fact, there's some professor out of Yale or Harvard that he's got like some huge stipend. If you can prove either system, you'll get that, and nobody's collected on it. So um, it's probably stuff like, well, then we would explain it like this, that um, also there's speeds. So notice what Copernicus has circles, but we notice that uh, planets actually speed up. And so that's why Kepler had to actually pause it so if there's an anomaly, right? There's an anomaly in the Copernican system. It's like, yeah, but your system doesn't explain why planets move faster. Well, what does Kepler do? Oh yeah, it does if I put it on um, in ovals, right? Because the distance to get here to here is gonna be shorter if what? If right here, like it's an oval and not versus a circle. It's gonna take me longer to get to these two points than it would be. So I imagine it would be up, uh, updated. Um, well, that's a good question. So there's another group of uh, philosophers of science called Klein and Duham. It's called the underdetermination of data thesis. And what they were able to show is that you could have multiple scientific theories. So let's say scientific theory says now reality looks like this. And scientific theory B says no, -uh, it looks like this. Scientific theory C says, no, oh, you're all wrong. It's... One of the rules, we have kind of like rules for science that we like to, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but it's like what we like to do. Um, parsimony, sim like that's simplicity. So it's sort of like mathematics, right? The math teacher is going to like, so let's say both students go up to the board to prove something, and one's like, and the other one's like, right? And it's like 30 minutes later, you're like, it's just what, what the first student do? They did like two lines. And that's simplicity, and we like that in science too. That's one reason to reject the Ptolemaic system and go for a heliocentric, is that oh, it's simpler. Um, another one would be. It needs to fit the observations. It needs to have predictability, right? You should be able to predict. So you can rule stuff out. If I was like, okay, according to my scientific theory of gravity, blah, 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 if I throw this mass with a certain velocity and directionality, it'll carve out a certain parabolic arc. <clears throat> and it's like, it goes backwards, right? It starts doing, it's like, well, your, <laughs> your theory's out, okay? So you can, falsify and get rid of theories 
But then what Quine and Duheim noticed is, uh, this is really interesting. You can't prove a theory by looking at the evidence simply why or the theory fitting the observation. So if this was the kind of evidence, if reality is evidence or observation, they found you can have multiple theories that will all account for the same observations and they'll all work like they might be different like they might have particular anomalies but every system has an anomaly somewhere that's usually the critique it's like there's no perfect scientific system it's like got it all worked out and there's no more questions anymore <laughs>